No Name by Wilkie Collins, dramatised by Ray Jenkins, with Sophie Thompson as Magdalene Vanston, Jack May as Captain Rag, Eleanor Bronn as Mrs. Leconte, and Nigel Anthony as Noel Vanston. Episode 3, June 1847. Magdalene Vanston and her sister Nora have been orphaned and disinherited because of illegitimacy. Magdalene has determined to try and wrest her inheritance from her cousin Noel Vanston with the help of Captain Rag. My dear girl, Mr. Noel Vanston has moved to one of his late father's empty houses in Vauxhall Walk, London. Such a shabby sight must mean the money and the father are still not easily parted. What are you saying? Mr. Michael Vanston left no will. And Mrs. Leconte? Remains in the same housekeeping capacity. If there had been a will, there is no doubt I learn, she would have received a, a handsome legacy. So, she is entirely dependent on Mr. Noel Vanston's gratitude. Indeed. Chronicle of Events, the 21st of June. Magdalene has written to Mr. Noel Vanston by today's post. June the 25th. The answer has come. As an ex-military man, a diversion was naturally employed to get at it. Mrs. Leconte writes that her employer's delicate health and recent loss prevent him from replying personally. Any further letters will be returned unopened. Any personal application will result in an immediate appeal to the police. And she has tried to avoid giving unnecessary pain by addressing Miss Vanston as a matter of courtesy by the family name. June the 29th. I am swindled. The whole future of the dramatic entertainment is abandoned. Why? There are more inquiries to be made. They are to do with a woman, and I mean to make them myself in London. Mrs Leconte, when will you be leaving? On the 28th. Along? Probably not. By yourself? With Mrs Rag, if you have no objection. Good God, why? The woman's a fool. It will be easier to get respectable lodgings accompanied by an elderly female. Will this elderly male be left out of the business altogether? Impossible to say at the moment. Hmm. One thing, my wife will be useful in keeping up Miss Vanston's connection with me. Therefore, I consent to brush my own trousers and shave my own chin for a limited period. I open these pages to record a discovery. At the railway station, I remark that Miss Vanston had only taken one of her three boxes with her. I quickly ascertained that one of the two left behind contained nothing of interest, and the other, devoted to the costumes, etc., used in the dramatic entertainment, to be complete, except for the dress, wig, eyebrows and bonnet of her old North Country lady. She is going to open her campaign against Noel Vanston and Mrs Leconte in the character of her old governess. I know it. Having got her secret, what am I to do with it? Which way do my interests point now? Upon my honour, I don't know. A masterly compromise. I have today dispatched to London an anonymous letter to Mr Vanston, warning him, in the most alarming language possible, that he is destined to become the victim of a conspiracy, and offering him information necessary to secure his own safety if he makes it worth the writer's while. On the same day as Captain Rag completed the last entry in his Chronicle of Events, a woman appeared at the window of one of the houses in Vauxhall Walk, and removed from the glass a printed paper, which had been wafered to it, announcing that apartments were to be let, two rooms on the first floor. They'd just been taken for a week certain by two ladies, who had paid in advance. 
here's all the things I'm going to buy when I'm out shopping tomorrow. Lend us your pencil, please. Why are you at the window all the time? Just watching. Well, the blinds all down opposite. What can there be to see? Pencil, you won't be angry, will you? I want to mark them. It's by your elbow. Oh. <laughs> no cookery book. No buzzing in my head. No captain to shave. I'm all down at heel, my cap's on one side, and nobody pulls me out. <laughs> Here's a holiday. <gasps> there he is. Living on our money. It was kind of your daughter to take my friend shopping. I'm very grateful. Oh, you giving her money to buy a parasol helped, I tell you. And what does your day bring? Me? Oh, bless you. The kids will be back for food at one, and I've got enough to do out the back. It, it won't be too quiet for you. It's what I wish for. Magdalene's mind was fully alive to the vast difference between a disguise worn by gaslight before an audience and one assumed in daylight to deceive the searching eyes of two strangers. Wig fitted, false eyebrows carefully gummed, the lines and markings of age followed next, but in broad daylight look plainly false. A veil is adopted, and the impropriety of keeping it down while speaking to other persons she solves by deliberately disfiguring herself, reddening the insides of her eyelids so as to produce an appearance of inflammation none but a doctor at close quarters could have detected. Lastly, the quiet grey cloak leaves her facing the house opposite nothing but an ailing, ill-made, unattractive woman of 50 years of age. Would Nora know me if we met in the street? No, not even Nora. Yes, ma'am. Is Mrs. LeConte in? Yes, ma'am. Will you wait in here, please? Thank you. Oh. Oh. Don't be alarmed. <laughs> My white toad hurts nobody. He's quite safe in the tank. I apologise. Mrs. Leconte, have I the pleasure of addressing the lady who called an hour ago, Miss Garth? Yes. Accept my excuses for receiving you here, but we leave for the seaside tomorrow, and it's not been thought worthwhile to set the house in proper order. Pray sit down. Ah, so far as you see from a complaint of the eyes, I must beg your permission to wear my veil down and sit away from the light. And to what circumstances am I indebted for the honour of this visit? I lived for many years as governess in the family of the late Mr Andrew Vanston of Coombe Raven, and I come here in the interests of his orphan daughters. I am surprised you can bear the light out of doors without a green shade. It keeps me eyes too hot at this time of year. May I ask again? In what way do you believe your errand can possibly concern me? Because Mr Noel Vanston's intention towards the two young ladies were made known to them in the form of a letter from yourself. Oh, you are mistaken, ma'am, in supposing I exercise my influence in this painful matter. I am the pen Mr Van Stone holds, if you will excuse the expression, nothing more. If you wish to speak to him on the subject of the young ladies... No, poor things. I'll call them the Miss Van Stones. What is it to me, whether their parents were married or not? I'll mention your name. He is in the parlour. If I'm not taking undue advantage of your kindness. On the contrary. Oh. Whose blood runs coldest? Yours, you monster of a toad, or hers? Mr. Van Stone will see you if you will kindly wait a few minutes. Be careful, ma'am. 
not to depress his spirit, nor to agitate him in any way. His heart has been a cause of serious anxiety to those about him from his earliest years. I looked at the tank while you were out of the room. You have heard of the late Professor Le Comte, the eminent Swiss naturalist? I am his widow. Eminent in many things. The professor was an expert on reptiles. He left me his subjects and his tank. Properly understood, the reptile creation is beautiful. Properly dissected, instructive to the last degree. So refreshing to the touch, a touch skin, Miss Garth. So nice and cool this summer weather. Oh, follow me, if you please. Ah, take a seat, Miss Garth. I'm Noel Vanston. You wish to see me? Here I am. May I be permitted to retire, sir? Certainly not. Whatever you say to me, ma'am, you say to her. The Comte is a domestic treasure. Do you mind what you're about, ma'am? Your sleeve nearly knocked my Persian candlestick. Uh, sit down, Le Comte. Mrs. Le Comte is like the curious here, one of my father's bargains. Do you like my father's dressing gown? Now, perhaps you're no judge of texture. You'd prefer to talk about your pupils. Are they fine girls, plump, fresh, full-blown English beauties? Oh, I really must beg permission to retire, sir, if you speak of the poor things in that way. Oh, you good creature. You would observe, she pities the two girls. I don't go as far as that myself. Splendid strawberries. Consider Miss Garth as a favour to me, sir. Thank you, but I make no claim to be treated with any extraordinary consideration. I am a governess, and I don't expect it. All I beg Mr Vanston for his own sake is to hear what I have to say to him. You understand, sir? Miss Garth has some serious warning to give you. Oh, if you come here to intimidate me, you come to the wrong man, doesn't she, Lecomte? Indeed, sir. Hmm. But perhaps I have misunderstood Miss Garth's meaning. My object in coming here is to warn Mr Vanston against the course he is now taking. Oh, don't. If you want to help those poor girls, talk in that way. There. You hear the unsolicited testimonial of a person who has known me since childhood. Take care, Miss Garth. I have known the two sisters since childhood. You have nothing to dread from the elder. But the younger has already declined to submit to your father's decision and now refuses to be silenced by Mrs. Lecomte's letter. Take my word for it. She is capable of giving you serious trouble if you persist in making an enemy of her. Well, she's done it already. One of her letters to my father was a threatening one, wasn't it, Lecomte? Oh, she expressed her feelings, poor child, their words, nothing more. I know her better than you do. In the letter she wrote you, sir, is there anything unbecoming or false? Isn't it true the girls have been cruelly deprived? I don't attempt to deny it. Is it not true that the law which has taken the money from the sisters, whose father made no second will, has given it to you, whose father made no will? Surely this is hard. Very hard. Harrowing. But how Miss Vanstone discovered that my late respected master made no will, I am at a loss to understand. But I'm interrupting you. The letter. I have seen it. Ask your sense of justice to give the sisters what their father's will intended them to have. Half the money. Leaving you free to keep the other half yourself. That is the proposal. Why have you refused to consider it? No, I've lived for too long in the continental atmosphere to trouble myself about moral points of view, ma'am. My course in this business is plain. I've got the money. I'd be a born idiot if I parted with it. Those are your last words. Precisely so. Dear Mr Noel, let me suggest what you call it in English, a, a compromise. Follow your dear father's example. Do what he did. No more, no less. Miss Garth. If he gives one hundred pounds each to these unfortunate... Then he'll repent the insult to the last hour of his life. Ah, oh, yeah, you mean well, Mrs. Leconte, but my pupils will accept no such compromise. I, I, I'm sorry to have spoken so violently just now. I beg you will excuse me. What more can I do? May I retire, sir? I must have a glass of water. Yeah. Don't go yet, Miss Garth. <clears throat> You 
May I offer you some strawberries, Mum? No, thank you. I am naturally a gallant man, and, and I feel for both these sisters, especially the younger one. Touch me on the subject of the tender passion, and you found a, a weak place. Nothing would please me more than to hear Miss Vanston's lover had come back and married her. If a loan of money... Stop, it... sir. You are seriously wrong if you think marriage would make the slightest difference to her convictions. Mrs. LeConte had never left the room. After opening and closing the door... Without leaving, she had noiselessly knelt down behind Magdalene's chair, hidden by a folding door dividing the room, taken her scissors and cut a fragment from the inner of two flounces on Miss Garth's brown alpaca dress. I know her, Mr Vanston. The resolution to right that wrong burns in her like fire. I tell you, she would shrink from no means which a desperate woman can employ to force that closed hand of yours open or die in the attempt. Quietly repeating the ceremony of opening and closing the parlour door without having left the room, the housekeeper returns. Look on! Oh, what has happened? Your pains! Oh, oh, Miss Garth, have you forgotten the caution I gave you? Look on, she, she, she threatened my life. I forbid you to pity either of them. If she can't get my money by fair means... Oh, she compose in... yourself, sir, and leave me to speak to Miss Garth. <laughs> this girl boasts and threatens, ma'am. But tell me, in plain words, what can she do? I can only assure you, from my knowledge of her, she is no booster. I have not come here to intimidate Mr Vanston by empty threats, but I leave him with two alternatives... Share the fortune with Mr Andrew Vanston's daughters or face the consequences. Good day. Uh, are you residing in London, ma'am? No, in the country. If I wish to write to you, where can I address my letter? The post office, Birmingham. A word of advice, ma'am. You are a bold and clever woman. But you are risking more than you think. I hold you in the hollow of my hand. What, what do you mean? Time will show. Oh, and do try the golden ointment for that sad affliction in your eye. Good afternoon. Uh, afternoon. Uh, Mr. Noel Vanson, Esquire. I'll take it. Thank you. Ma'am. Have you got rid of Miss Garth? Oh, she is as much Miss Garth as you are. Had she painted the marks on her face as well as she did her eyes, I would not have seen the young woman's skin under the dirt. In my opinion, Mr. Noel, we have been visited by the girl herself. And a bold girl, too. They lock the door and send for the police. A letter for you, sir. Who are you? Mind me, parcels. Who are you? Oh, heavens. I must take this makeup off. Oh, my goodness, help me. Mrs. Frank. What's the matter? What you got that round your face for? I, I've got a headache. Anything wrong, ma'am? Nothing whatever. Well, where is she? That woman who scuttled into your room. Nobody has. Come and see for yourself. She had a grey cloak and a poke bonnet. There. No one. Give us a prayer book. I've seen a ghost. It's for me being happy away from the captain and being down at heel in half the shops in London. Sit here and try and compose yourself while I bathe oh, my head. Oh, how can I? Oh, the worst buzzing I ever had with the cooking's nothing to what I've got with the ghost. Take me back home, please. Oh, yes, yes, you are getting better already, Mr Noel. <laughs> this letter is a Poultry attempt to frighten you. What does it say? You are an object of a conspiracy by Miss Vanstone. We know it. What else? Valuable information to give if you will pay for it. What did you call this person yourself? Just now, sir. A, 
a scoundrel? <laughs> I agree with you in that, as I do in everything else. You will lay a trap for the information in return for the trap for the money. You will answer the letter and see what comes of the answer. Uh, you seem to forget, Lecomte. The man wants money. Which you offer, sir, but as your thoughts have already anticipated, you don't give him. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I am so glad to see you getting back your good spirits. Shall I make a little sketch, sir, and you correct it afterward? I will not offer the scoundrel money. There's no trouble in being liberal when you know you won't have to pay. I don't dictate, Leconte. You are the master, sir. Well, what have you written? An unknown friend is requested to mention by advertisement an address at which a letter can reach him. The receipt of the information which he offers will be acknowledged by a reward of... What sum of money do you wish me to set down, sir? One hundred pounds? Good heavens, five pounds will do. Oh. Oh, sir, we must... Money matters are my business. My father was master before me and I am my father's son. Lecon, I am my father's son. Five pounds! Ah! It's only me. Oh, I thought it was the ghost again. If I close my eyes tonight, I'll go to sleep straight as my legs will let me. I hope I shall be forgiven. If ever a woman wanted as little forgiving as you do. Well, come on. I want to see what you've been buying today. Open this one. What is it? Did you get it a bargain? Dirt cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Westmoreland House, Kensington, July the 2nd, 1847. My dearest Magdalene, when you write next, and soon, address your letter to me here at Miss Garth's. I have left my situation, and some little time may elapse before I find another. You were discovered performing in public at Derby by one of the solicitors of the family. They tried to make it a condition of my further employment that you should never visit me, meet me, or walk out with me near the children. I so much resented the slur on you. I had to leave. I've saved a little money, Magdalen, and I should so like to spend it staying a few days with you. My heart aches for a sight of my sister. The way to happiness is often very hard to find... Harder, I almost think, for women than for men. I think my way now is the way which leads to seeing you again. Shanghai, China, April 23rd, 1847. My dear Magdalene, I have deferred answering your letter in consequence of the distracted state of my mind. My prospects in China are all at an end. The firm to which I was brutally consigned has worn out my patience by a series of petty insults, and I have felt compelled to withdraw my services, which were undervalued from the start. My returning to England under these circumstances is out of the question. It matters little what becomes of me. I am a wanderer and an exile entirely through the fault of others. With no prospects before me and no chance of coming home, what hope can I feel of performing my engagement to yourself? None. I write this with tears in my eyes. You shall not link your fate to an outcast. Accept these heartbroken lines as releasing you from your promise. Our engagement is at an end. Oh, Frank, no. The one consolation which supports me in bidding you farewell is that neither of us is to blame. You may have acted weakly under my father's influence, but I'm sure you acted for the best. <laughs> Captain, for mercy's sake, come here and help us. She had a dreadful letter yesterday, but she read it in bed, and when I went in with her breakfast, I found her dead. And if the doctor had not been two doors off, nobody else could have brought her back to life again. And she sits and looks dreadful and won't speak a word. Her eyes frighten me, so I shake from head to foot. Oh, please do come. I keep things tidy, tidy as I can. And I do like her so. 
For God's sake, write me one line to say where I can find you. I've just heard from old Mr. Clare. Oh, Magdalen, the thought of you alone among strangers, heartbroken, never leaves me. No words can tell how I feel for you. My own love, remember the better days at home before that cowardly villain stole his way into your heart. Don't, don't treat me like a stranger. One line, only one line to tell me where I can find you. My dearest Nora, my mind lives and breathes once more. It was dead until I got your letter. The shock I have suffered has left a strange quietness in me. I feel as if I have parted from my former self. My darling, I think no woman ever knows how utterly she has given herself up to the man she loves until that man ill-treats her. Strange, but if he repented and came back to me, I would die rather than marry him now. But it grates on me to see that word coward written against him in your hand. If he is weak of purpose, who tried his weakness beyond what it could bear? Michael Vanston. He robbed us of our own. He forced Frank away from me to China. You will say, after what has happened, it is well that I have escaped. My love, there is something perverse in me which answers no. Better to have been Frank's wretched wife than the free woman I am now. Let me live, Nora in the hope of better times for you, which is all the hope I have left. Forgive me, Captain, for the way I received you when you arrived. You were ill, my dear girl, all forgiven. Thank you. And you wish to employ me once again? Say the word, blood count. One. I want you to get rid of every article of clothing used in the dramatic entertainment. Ah, oh, I anticipate bad news. I have done with our performances forever. Two, I want you to trace Mr. Noel Vanston to his seaside residence, then find a small furnished house near him. Take it for a month certain to begin with. That is for yourself, your wife and your niece. Use any assumed name you please from your bottomless books. The perennial question, my dear, rears its sordid head. Any expenses I will immediately repay. Then tomorrow. It's done. Three. Take advantage of any accidental chance to become acquainted with Mr. Noel Vanston. It's vital to my present object. Four. Observe Mrs. Leconte in particular. Whatever help you can give at the outset of blindfolding that woman's sharp eyes will be the most precious help I have ever received at your hands. She is vicious. Welcome to North Shingles, Alborough. How near does he live? The fifth one down. May I speak now? Stand straight and listen. Do you know whose skin you're in at this moment? What is your name? Matilda. Nothing of the sort. It's Julia. Oh! Who am I? Hold that bag of savages straight or I'll pitch it into the sea. Who am I? I don't know. I am Mr. Bygrave Thomas. You are Mrs. Bygrave Julia. That young lady who travelled with you from London is Miss Bygrave Susan. Spare my poor head till I've got the coach out of it. Don't distress her. She'll learn it in time. Oh. Now, show me everything. You look fatigued. I'm afraid the journey has been too much for you. I'm always weary now. Weary of bed, weary of getting up. Weary of those voices out there. Where can we go and talk? There's perfect quiet within half a mile. Take me there. In my wife's existing state of ignorance as to who she is, we had better not trust her alone in the house and with a new servant. I'll go and turn the key on her in case she wakes up before we are back. I'll be outside. Good evening. I beg your pardon? I said... Good evening. Oh. Come away, Robert. You're distressing her. 
Come away, man. A friend of yours? What? Uh, no. Certainly not. A fine-looking man. Does he belong to this place? I'll find out. It's of no consequence. We can't be too careful about strangers. Good day, sir. That gentleman, is he a local man? Uh, he's a captain, sir. Captain Kirk, Reverend Stephen's brother-in-law, sir. Thank you, good sirs. He's the brother-in-law of the vicar, the sea captain, name of Kirk. He's off back to China at the end of the week. No time to bother us. What do I care about the man or his ship? Which way? Allow me. The eyes of our neighbours are upon us. The least your niece can do is take your arm. Shall I introduce you? No. Wait and hear what I have to tell you first. Sir, Mrs. Leconte, good evening. Sir. Fine girl, Leconte. You know I'm a judge of that sort of thing. Fine girl. Yes, sir. Indeed. Mrs. Lacan's one weak point, if she has such a thing, is a taste for science. Implanted by her husband who left her his reptiles, I've told you. Indeed. Having offered to collect her packet of tea from Ipswich, I also purchased a copy of Joyce's Scientific Dialogues. Possessing, as I do, a quick memory, I propose privately inflating my new skin with as much ready-made science as it will hold and presenting Mr. Bygrave to Mrs. Lacan's notice in the character of the most highly informed man she has met since the professor's death. The money is mine by right. Just so. But the means of arriving at that right which were hard with the father are easier with the son. Perfectly. Write me down an ass for the first time in my life. But hang me if I know what you mean. I mean to marry him. I've lost all care for myself. I have only one end in life now, and the sooner I reach it and die, the better. I will take the short and vilest way. Marrying him as my niece, Miss Bygrave? Yes. And after the marriage? I shall no longer need you. Until then, I need you to preserve your own new skin and mine and prevent Mrs. Leconte from discovering who I am. The rest is my responsibility only. I pay all our expenses here, and on the day of the marriage, you take a farewell gift of £200 away with you. Yes or no? Uh, give me a minute. Take as long as you like Utterly incapable of appreciating the injury done her by Frank's treachery, Captain Wragg is mainly influenced in making up his mind by no lesser figure than Mr. Noel Vanston himself. The prospect of dealing a blow in the dark at the man who had estimated his information and himself at the value of a five-pound note proved too much for his self-control. I accept! I'm going down to the water. Wait there. Miss Vanston! Ah, Miss Bygrave! Susan! Oh, you alarmed me. I was afraid something had happened. Doesn't matter. It's over now. I threw Frank's lock of hair into the sea. Ah, Lizzie. Where's William? Out. Uh, Mrs. Crabbe's sick. Uh, but he did have time to tell me about the young lady he had to pull you away from. Robert? Robert Kirk, is it serious? You can't think me half such a fool as I do myself. I'm 40. I didn't set eyes on her for as much as a minute altogether. And here I've been hanging about the place till gone nightfall on the chance of seeing her again. Skulking. I'm bewitched. Lizzie, I'm old enough to be her father. There's not a woman alive who's good enough for you. What's her name? Bygrave. Do you know it? 
No, but... Uh... I asked for the paper at the inn for the list of visitors. Originally, I thought she was from Seaview Cottage, and that's taken by a, a Mr Vanstone. And? You don't remember? Father knew a subaltern of that name when he was with his regiment in Canada. It would have been strange if she'd been the child of... No, no, no. No, I got the name wrong. Well, if there was time, I might soon make acquaintance with her. But you sail at the end of the week. Thank God I do. You mean you're glad to be going away? Lizzie, I've spent my life at sea. I'm not used to having my mind upset in this way. Men ashore are used to it. Can take it easy. I can't. She's got between me and my thoughts already. She shan't between me and my duty. Fool as I am, I have sense enough not to trust myself with an easy hail of Alborough tomorrow morning. I'm good for another 20 miles of walking, and I'll begin my journey back tonight. Won't you promise the boys? Well, you can light me upstairs to kiss them. What am I to say to William? <laughs> you can tell him I've taken his last sermon to heart. Mm, I've turned my back on the world, the flesh, and the devil. Well, shall I go to Alborough no, and no, see if... No, 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 let her be. If it's ordained I'm to see that girl again, I shall. Now, the boys. I can lock up my wife for her patterns, hammer her new skin into her head, but I can't hammer the ghost out of it. Oh, my dear girl, Mrs. Rag is a pitfall under our feet. If we're aware of it, we can avoid it. What do we do? Have her comfortably boarded and lodged out of the way for the time being say at a retired farmhouse in the character of a lady of infirm mental health? No. The poor creature's life is hard enough already. She was truly kind to me when I was ill. I won't allow her to be shut up. Think twice before you keep her. I won't have her sent away. Very good. I never interfere with questions of sentiment. But if my services are to be of any use to you, I can't have my hands tied at starting. I won't trust my wife and Mrs. Lacan together. I make it a condition that if Mrs. Rag stops here, she keeps to her room. If you think her health merits it, you can take her for a walk. Only you. Early morning or late evening. I agree. <laughs> Excellent. Are you ready for your first introduction to the monster and her master? Yes. We will meet them on the parade at their usual time, two o'clock. I have a couple of hours before me, therefore. Just enough to fit my wife into her new skin. <laughs> you had a disturbed night, I'm afraid. That man who stared at me still seemed to be looking through me in my dreams. If we see him again and he annoys me any more, I must trouble you to speak to him. Hmm, charming. Blue and white. So fresh and cool. But a little too pale, my dear, and a great deal too serious. When the time comes for smiling, trust my dramatic training for any change of face that may be necessary. Where is Mrs. Rag? Mrs. Rag has learnt her lesson and is rewarded by my permission to dressmake in her room. Her new fancy will absorb all her attention. She will sit incubating her gown, pardon the expression, like a hen over an adult egg. <laughs> ah, there they are. Where? Ah. Uh, oh. He makes me ill. He even has to be shaded from the sun. She certainly dresses for the part. A very domestic lady. A truly superior woman. Tough work for us there. We'll go in the opposite direction. Turn, then meet them as they come back. Smile. The walk's improved your complexion, and the hat becomes you. Speak to her enough to see if she recognises your voice. And don't take too much notice of Vanston while her eyes on you. Steady. Good day, Mrs. Leconte. Good day, sir. I'm sorry to see you suffering. Uh, Mrs. Leconte, permit me to introduce my niece, Miss Bygrave. Ma'am? My dear girl, this is Mr. Noel Vanston, our neighbour. Sir? Charm. You possess the continental facility of manner, Mr. Vanston. I met you with the blunt cordiality of an old-fashioned Englishman. 
The ladies mingle together in harmonious variety, like flowers in the same bed. <laughs> Pardon my flow of spirits, the notorious effect of the iodine in the sea air, Mrs. Lacan. <laughs> <laughs> you arrived yesterday, Miss Bygrave, did you not? My aunt and I came here yesterday evening. We found the latter part of the journey very fatiguing. I dare say you found it too. <laughs> you complain of headache, sir, a few minutes ago. Will you go inside and rest? Well, I fancy I feel a little stronger, the court. I can go on a little. I found a new interest in the day, Miss Bygrave. Don't desert us or you will take the interest away with you. Shall we walk? That would be charming. A busy sea, Mrs. Leconte. <laughs> the true greatness of England, ma'am. Pray observe how heavily some of those vessels are laden. I'm often inclined to wonder whether the British sailor is at all aware, when he has got the cargo on board, of the hydrostatic importance of the operation he has performed. My father, my father had the house built on piles. I reason to believe they are the strongest piles in England. Nothing, I don't care what the sea does. Nothing can possibly knock them down. Then if the sea invades us, we must all run for refuge to you. <laughs> <laughs> I could almost wish the invasion might happen. It is northwest and by west too. You will remind me of the experiment of that illustrious philosopher who measured the velocity of a great storm by a flight of small feathers. My dear madam, I grant all your propositions. <laughs> I beg your pardon, sir. You kindly attribute to me knowledge that I don't possess. Oh, ma'am, my remarks apply to the temperate zone only. <laughs> I am amazed, sir, by the range of your information. Have you extended your inquiries, sir, to my late husband's branch of science, the reptile creation? Mm, too vast a subject, ma'am. The life and labours of such a philosopher as your husband, Mrs. Leconte, warn smatterers like me not to measure themselves with giants. Oh. May I inquire whether you possess any scientific memorials of the late professor? I have his tank, sir, and one of his subjects, a little foreign toad. Oh, objects of public interest. <laughs> And as one of the public, I acknowledge my curiosity to see them. You are very good, sir. In honouring my husband's memory, you honour me. <laughs> May I make a request, sir? Yes, of course, of course. Mr. Bygrave honours me by wishing to see my little world of reptiles. May I show it to him? By all means, Lacan. You are an excellent creature, and I like to oblige you. Lacan's tank, Mr. Bygrave, is the only tank in England. The concert toad is the oldest toad in the world. Oh, sir, <laughs> will you come and drink tea at seven o'clock tonight? And uh, bring Miss Bygrave with you. Come punctually and pray. Wear that charm, in fact. I presume Mrs. Bygrave is too tired to come out today. Shall we have the pleasure of meeting her tomorrow? There is some remote mischief at work in my wife which doesn't express itself externally, ma'am. She sees no society. Our medical attendant, I regret to say, absolutely prohibits it. Very sad. The poor lady must often feel lonely. Oh, no. Mrs. Bygrave is a naturally domestic woman. When she is able to employ herself, she finds unlimited resources in her needle and thread. Indeed. I have great hope from the air of this place. The iodine, as I have already observed, does wonders. Do you make a long stay at Albrecht, sir? It all depends, my dear madam, on Mrs. Bygrave. I trust we shall stay through the autumn. You are settled at Seaview Cottage, I presume, for the season. Oh, you must ask my master. Hmm? It is for him to decide, not... Oh, you know as well as I do, Lacan. It all depends on you. Lacan has a brother in Switzerland who is severely ill. If he gets worse, she'll have to go and see him. I can't accompany her, and I can't be left in the house by myself. If it depended on me... I should stay at Oldborough all through the autumn. Au revoir. Good night, sir. Well, my dear, not a difficult evening. Mm -hmm. There's not the least reason for alarm. Mrs. Leconte may fancy she's heard something like your voice before, but your face evidently bewilders her. Keep your temper and you keep her in the dark. Keep her in the dark? And I put 200 pounds in your hands before the season's out. Hmm. Her brother lives in Zurich. He's a bachelor, possesses little money. 
If he will oblige us by breaking up altogether, he will save us a world of trouble with the monster. As soon as the candle was out, darkness seemed to communicate some inexplicable perversity to Mrs. LeConte's thoughts. Past, present, wondered. The face and figure of the young girl, unforgettable. The death of her master. Mrs. Bagrave is a naturally a domestic woman. Remote, nervous, mischief. Yet in the best of health and able to play her needle. Strange lady. I beg your permission to wear my veil down and sit away from the left. You can perform the experiment I have just mentioned to your own entire satisfaction. With a bladder, an exhausted receiver, and a square bottle. Strange trio. The man's a scoundrel. I agree with you in that. You seem to forget the call. The man wants money. You will lay a trap for the information in return for the trap. Hold you in the hollow of my hand. I make no claim to be treated with any extraordinary consideration. I am a governess. Miss Garth has some serious warning to give you. I know her, Mr. Banston. The resolution to right that wrong burns in her like fire. I tell you, she would shrink. Miss Vanstone again. Evidence. And as for you, Mr. Bygrave, you have trifled with the sacred memory of my husband. On my life and honor, I will make you pay for it. Good morning. What is it? A letter from Sea View. Read it. Mr. Noel Vanston wishes us to drive with him along the coast today. Sharing the expense of the carriage. Oh. Hidden enmity yesterday and open friendship today. Hmm. Which means Mrs. LeConte is even sharper than I thought her. She has found you out. How? If she hadn't, she'd keep Mr. Noel Vanston far from your claws. She may know more of your voice than we supposed she knew. Anyway, she wants to test you. So... Yesterday, Joyce was my all-in-all. All. Today, he's finished. Are you leaving me to my own devices? My dear girl, can't you accustom yourself to my dash of humour yet? Ready-made science is out because I'm sure she is done believing in me. My honour is concerned in bowling out Mrs. LeConte. It's become personal. The woman actually thinks she can take me in. By God, I've never been so insulted in my life. Listen... We'll go to Dunnage. I'll rain proofs of us being bygraves on Banston's feeble little brain till it aches with conviction. And me? You. You will, one, not be caught napping. Two, distrust everything Mrs. LeConte says. And three, exert all your fascinations. Wear your hat. Wear your smile. Lace your figure tight. And tie the miserable little runt to your apron strings. And tie him fast. Nothing occurred on the way to Dunwich to disturb the enjoyment of the drive. Noel Vanston was in excellent health and simpered continually. Mrs. LeConte was motherly with Magdalen, tender with her master, and meekly disappointed Captain Wragg's conversation had abandoned science. Allow me, LeConte. Oh, sir, I think Miss Bygrave... She will forgive me. This, after all, is your idea. Where of the cat? She will show her claws on the way back. <laughs> Miss Bygrave? Oh, thank you, Mr. Vanston. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure my master took the other path, Mr. Bygrave. Oh, we'll meet with them again, ma'am. All paths lead to home. Allow me. Wonderful ruins, ma'am. Indeed. And how perfect the German Ocean looks. 
Have you ever lived in London, sir? I will satisfy you, ma'am, on that point, if you, first, will oblige me on another. I have voyaged far and wide, but never have I had the pleasure of knowing your late husband's seat of scholarship. Ah, oh, Geneva. What can I tell you? <laughs> we have the privacy, ma'am, the time while the younger ones besport themselves, and I trust the disposition. Everything. Tell me all. Well? Oh, he has kissed my hand. Don't let him sit next to me on the way home. I've borne all I can bear. Spare me for the rest of the day. I'll put you on the front seat, side by side with me. She wants to find out if we've ever lived in Lambeth. I'll admit it, and the whole world. After leaving London, my worthy brother was established for 20 years in the mahogany and logwood trade of Belize, Honduras. He died there, and is buried in the local cemetery, beneath a neat monument of native wood carved by a self-taught Negro artist. Nineteen months later, his widow died in Cheltenham, and Susan is their only child. <laughs> May I inquire, Miss Bygrave, whether you know anything of a lady named Miss Gars? Why should I? It is a coincidence your uncle should have once resided in Vauxhall War. Uh, we lived there before we came here. A person, Miss Bygrave, presenting herself, we believe, under that name, paid us a visit under very extraordinary circumstances. Ten thousand pardons, my dear madam. I see in my niece's face, in her pulse, one of her violent neuralgic attacks has come on again. No, 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 please. My dear girl, why hesitate among friends to confess that you're in pain? What mistimed politeness. Oh, Miss Bygrave. Darting pains on the left side of the head, sir. Pull down your veil, my dear. Coachman, coachman, slow down. Where's your smelling bottle, Leconte? And, and, and coachman, drive carefully, or you shan't have a halfpenny if you shake the young lady. better. You were very quick. <laughs> As is my wont, my dear. Mrs. Leconte puzzles me. I propose to return the compliment by puzzling her. A course of action? Simple. I have had the honour of giving you a severe neuralgic attack, and I beg your permission, when Mr. Noel Vanston sends to inquire tomorrow morning, to take the further liberty of laying you up altogether. Why? My object is twofold. <laughs> I blush for my own stupidity, but the fact is, I can't see my way plainly to Mrs. Leconte's next move. All I feel sure of, she means to make another attempt at opening her master's eyes to the truth. To find out who you are, she must have communication with you. By stopping that communication, I, as we say at cards, force her hand. And the second reason? Love flourishes in adversity. Our first aim was to make Vanston feel the charm of your society. Achieved. Oof, thank you. The second is to drive him distracted by the loss of it. Hence the headaches. Yes or no? Anything which keeps me out of their company. Good. I see you're tired. Please understand. She has hurt me to some purpose. She's given me the courage to go on. Excellent. You're going into Mrs. Rag's room? I want to take her out of this hole and upstairs with me. For the evening? The whole fortnight. Do you seriously wish to inflict my wife's society on yourself for 14 days? She's the only innocent creature in this guilty place. I must and will have her with me. Shh, shh, shh. Pray, pray don't agitate yourself. Take Mrs. Rag by all means. I don't want her. The weakness of the sex. Lay a strain on the female intellect, and the female temper gives way directly. And the interview was terminated at the point where the disguised woman threatened my employer. Without any desire to inflict pain, I must register my belief that the person claiming to be Miss Garth was in all probability your sister. I must further add that my employer is in possession of sufficient evidence
to justify him putting the law into force. He only hesitates in deference to family considerations and in the hope you might so influence your sister as to render it unnecessary to proceed to extremities. Events here in Olbra will enable me to gain sight of the suspected person in her own character. But as I am unacquainted with the younger Miss Van Stone, it is obviously desirable that some better informed person should help. If you happen to be at liberty to come to Olbra, would you kindly write back and appoint a day? If, on the other hand, you are prevented from taking the journey, Perhaps your reply could furnish us with the fullest description possible, including mention of any little distinguishing marks, say, to her face or hands. I assure you, in the interest of the young lady herself, I will immediately write back after the observation and acquaint you with the result. Now I've got her. That was episode three of No Name by Wilkie Collins, dramatized by Ray Jenkins. Magdalene Vanston was played by Sophie Thompson, Captain Rag by Jack May, Mrs. Leconte by Eleanor Bron, Mrs. Rag by Vivian Pickles, Noel Vanston by Nigel Anthony, and Captain Kirk by Robin Ellis. Nora was Elizabeth Mansfield, Frank Clare was Paul Downing, Lizzie was Alice Arnold, the vicar, Joe Dunlop, the landlady, Susan Sheridan, and the narrator was Philip Sully. The music was by Peter Bruis and was played by Maurice Cambridge. The director was Janet Whittaker. <laughs>